from the wild and woolly world of advertising. I, I hate to tell you, but advertising is not really as racy as Mad Men depicts in its television series is now circling the globe. A, a journalist from London called and said, how is that um, smoking, drinking, and sexing from the Mad Men era working today? And I said, well, there's a lot less smoking. <laughs> So something wonderful happened to me when I was quite young. I was a green account exec fresh up from Texas at the mighty J. Walter Thompson in Chicago. I had only then one woman to emulate, but she was a corker. She had black hair, black eyes, a very powerful, acid personality, a sharp tongue. I was walking down the hall one day, and I, re I heard her talking, the men laughing. And I realized that she was doing a devastating mockery of my Texas accent. I was paralyzed there. And in fact, I had trouble speaking after that. Then finally I realized I'm not going to last very long in this business if I don't voice out. I walked into her office desperate, really, shut the door. She frowned at me. I said, Marion, I'm not leaving here until you and I agree that we can unite so that the men cannot divide nor diminish us. And she said, what are you doing for lunch? <laughs> she took me out and taught me to drink scotch mist. <laughs> I did not go back to the office. <laughs> we became friends for life. It, wasn't much, it was much, much later that I learned that that rather successful moment of communication has a pattern that's familiar every time you are powerfully affected when you're speaking or acting or behaving in a certain way. The components go like this, clarity, personal clarity, memorability, and persuasiveness. And the reason it took me so long, and I'm still trying to master it, is because of that first one, personal clarity is like one giant step for mankind. It is not the clarity you bring to your PowerPoints and your strategic thinking. It is from within. It's the constellation of your attitudes, your responses, what you believe in, what bubbles up out of you, even unknowingly in your dialogue, in your relationships at work. I know about that because I think that for many years, for many, too many years, I was the work. I thought I was the work. I was really good at Thompson. I got the ads out. I was good with the clients. But it was all within an agreed framework. And I think we women are very susceptible to thinking we're the work. And we sometimes would prefer to let the work speak for us. So I was so hot. I thought, I would try on this CEO thing. So I agreed to go to this smaller agency, which was, quote, only slightly broken. Huh. So I began to fail almost immediately, because surrounding me were these messy, political, emotionally unnerving relationships. There will be a time when the relationships overwhelm the work. And it's something you're not ready for if you think you're the work. The creative department was very fond of drugging and drinking. You walk down the hall, you could smell only pot. This really unnerved me. The agency was greatly in debt, and I found a gut unease about all this follow. In fact, the structure was such that you could, they could seize your personal assets. Well, maybe any intelligent person would be alarmed. But I noticed something very interesting. The men down the hall from me didn't have these extreme reactions, this sense of panic that I did. But I didn't care. I, I couldn't do this. I got a job offer at another agency, more stable, not as big a title. I was out of there. One word stopped me from going. I was reading an anonymous review, a series of reviews we all did with one another. And I read, Charlotte is fearless. Fearless. I'm waking up at 4 o'clock panicked every night. She's brave. She defends us with the clients. She stands. And I see that I am that kind of strong and brave 
woman sometime. And maybe we all house both fearlessness and this fear that's running through. And I wanted to know, what is it in me that called out such disproportionate reactions and responses to these circumstances? And I began, I changed my mind and decided to stay. And as we rebuilt the agency, I began to learn who this Charlotte is that was joining me in work. And I found out that we carry forward family influences like luggage on our backs that influence how we behave and act. It's not so much how we do the work, it's how we deliver the work. And it's your delivery system that ultimately depicts who you are and how you move through your organization. The influences I had were very uh, important. My father was an alcoholic, and I knew that drinking and drugging could lead to volatile and dangerous acts, so I had the response of a five-year-old. The same thing's true of the money. We had a lot of uncertainty in our financial situation. I went to work to guarantee financial situations, and now I was in this fear. So I began to study which of these influences I would shed, amend, modify. And I went to Children of Alcoholics. I kept a journal. I recommend it. You keep a journal. You watch yourself. You watch who you are becoming and how you're behaving. I also learned that in addition to influences, we carry within us these powerful traits. And it's the traits that depict what you're so fond of looking at on your resume. I believe one trait comes from your family, like a pa genetic pass along. So my family trait was a lethal form of impatience. I do not recommend this, but <laughs> traits are important because they don't leave you. You might as well deal with them. There's another trait that is very priceless. You need to know this trait in yourself. It is that which makes you unique. It fires you up. It makes you excited. It's something you own. You can't blame it on anyone else. My bread in the bone trait was all things being equal, I would just rather be in charge. Now, if you take those two traits, impatience and in charge, they are not on the top 10 list of who wants to marry me. <laughs> but some people did anyway. But <laughs> you don't have to tell everything you know. So when Martin Sorrell wanted someone to turn around Ogilvy, which was 20 times bigger than the agency in which I had succeeded, he asked me to come do that. But here was what was more important. I knew that the ingredients that make up Charlotte would maybe be able to apply those to do another turnaround. So that's how you reach this degree of who you are, what you stand for, what you can count on. That's personal clarity. You cannot avoid this journey. Please take it. Use your life at work to define and expand and enhance who you are. So that's, cl that's clarity. Memorability is your agreement to master the art of communication. This is something you can acquire. People aren't born gilded tongue necessarily. It means that you know the golden rule of communication. It's not what you say, it's what they hear. And the cousin to that is you become extremely careful about your receiver. You know them, you respect them, even if you don't like them, and you understand that you are looking for a certain response. And instead of focusing on what you want to say, you worry on the, you work about the response. And the other thing that's very hard for us women to do is you edit, edit, edit. You eliminate the extraneous and the irrelevant. I'm very fond of saying everything twice. I like it again, I like it over. You take away the power when you need to be powerful, when you do that. Now, persuasion, the third leg on this three-legged stool, is a matter of having skin in the game. It means that you are prepared sometime to step right out of the team and say, I believe. You're convinced, you're committed, and you're willing to show that kind of unlikely passion that suggest you really believe in this. And what will happen is that people will understand you really mean it, and they will believe you. 
So if you have these three things working for you, you will find that when the relationships get difficult, these are the qualities of communication you will call on. So six years later at Tatham, we are, we are cooking now. We're really done a good job. And we win this big beer account, and this beer baron asked me to meet him in New York. But they don't usually deal with the agencies, but I think it's because we're so fabulous. And I go into New York. I meet him at the 21 Club. We come out, and he said, why don't you get rid of your car? We'll go in mine. And I walk over to my driver and say, follow us. I am a Texan. I need an exit plan. <laughs> but I must have known something, because we get in the car. We're driving along. He slaps the seat. And he said, you know, I forgot my papers. Driver, stop at the Helmsley. Would you like to see the company apartment? It's very smashing. And I think to myself, God, the guys at the office would love to hear about this. So I trottle along. We get in this elevator. It is a private elevator. And I look over at Howard, and he is weaving. Howard is drunk. And you can imagine how well I handle that. On the way up to the apartment, all my CEO ship and my confidence so hard won fell to my feet. And I calibrated, even as I was going into the apartment, that no one would believe I came to this innocently. So the apartment's very dark. Howard puts a strong hand on my arm and says, let me show you around. We walk into the darkest room imaginable. I fall right on the bed. Howard falls on top of me. In less than 20 minutes, I am lying there with my new client I've never met before on top of me. This is not good. <laughs> this is a moment where your communication needs to be with it. But I don't have it. I'm terrified. And it was only when I was lying there beyond panic that I, I got furious. How hard had I worked to create this brave picture of myself? How importantly had we all struggled at the agency to end up like this? I put my hands up on Howard's giant shoulders. Howard, you don't want to do this. And I shoved him. And to my surprise, he rolled like a ball. <laughs> I ran to the elevator, and I heard him sobbing. Now, this, children, is not the communication story. The big issue is, what are we going to do about this now? So all night long, I think about how not to lose the account. I know Howard is going to wake up hungover and revengeful or protective, possibly on the attack. I call this man at 6.30. I can't wait any longer. <laughs> Howard, this is Charlotte. Ugh. You were not yourself last night. That's an important statement. More grunting. I can't work with you anymore. I think it would be difficult. There is a great team we can put on this. And Howard, I expect this to go very well, right? And Howard says, <clears throat> Howard talks, right, it's a good plan. And I said, one more thing. You'll never hear of this episode again, Howard. And he says, Thank you. Clarity, memorability, persuasiveness, when you need it most. Now, you might not have chosen to handle that that way, but there will come a time. If you're trying to make change, if you want to offer something new, if you want to step out where there are no knowns and hope that people agree and sign on, you have to master this skill of being an artful communicator. And you can practice it in every day and everything you do, because one day you will want to say, this is actually the right thing to do. And when you turn around, they're following you. You know what that is? Do you know what the sound of that is? That is actually leadership. That's what it means to lead. I just want you ready for every single moment of leadership that comes your way. Thank you. <laughs>